Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students, welcome to Swayam Prabha. I am Dr. Vageshwari Deswal, a professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. We are doing a course on Substantive Criminal Law. Today, we will discuss the right of private defense and the occasions when the right of private defense extends to even voluntarily causing the death of the aggressor and also law relating to abetment. So, this is lesson 7 with the title private defense and abetment. To begin with, we will first revise the nature of right of private defense which is essentially meant to be a preventive and a protective right. It is not meant to be a punitive tool. It is not meant to be used as a means to punish or exact revenge from the aggressor. Section 38 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita lays down circumstances or the conditions when the right of private defense of body extends to voluntarily causing the death of the other person. So, what does the law say? The right of private defense of body extends under the restrictions specified in section 37. Now, what are the restrictions specified in section 37? That is, there is no right of private defense against the lawful acts of a public servant. There is no right of private defense against lawful acts done under authority of public servant. There is no right of private defense when there is time to have recourse to protection of public authorities and the right which you exercise to protect yourselves, it should not be disproportionate to the threat that you are faced with. So, the force which you use, it should be proportionate in measure to the harm that could have been inflicted upon you by the aggressor. So, those restrictions, they are to be read inside section 38. What it says, the right of private defense of the body extends under the restrictions specified in section 37 to the voluntary causing of death or of any other harm to the assailant if the offence which occasions the exercise of the right be of any of the descriptions herein after enumerated namely that is what does this law say that under these given clauses if there is any one person who tries to uh, threaten you and you have a reasonable apprehension of any of these following assaults, then in such cases you have the right to cause any injury to the aggressor even to the extent of causing his death. So, what are those conditions that occasion the exercise of right of private defense in full measure? 1. Such an assault as may reasonably cause the apprehension that death will otherwise be the consequence of such assault. Second, such an assault as may reasonably cause the apprehension that grievous hurt will otherwise be the consequence of such assault. Next, an assault with the intention of committing rape. Fourth, an assault with the intention of gratifying unnatural lust. Fifth, an assault with the intention of kidnapping or abducting. Sixth, an assault with the intention of wrongfully confining a person under circumstances which may reasonably cause him to apprehend that he will be unable to have recourse to public authorities for his release. And lastly, an act of throwing or administering acid or an attempt to throw or administer acid which may reasonably cause the apprehension that grievous hurt will otherwise be the consequence of such act. 
Section 39 lays down conditions when such right extends to causing any harm other than death. So, under section 38 the conditions are prescribed wherein you can even cause the death of the aggressor to protect yourself or to protect anyone else against an unlawful threat or aggression which has the capacity to cause any of the harm of the nature or descriptions as given under section 38. What section 39 lays down is also a very broad right, but in this you cannot exercise the right of private defense in full measure. That is it would occasion the exercise of right of private defense to cause any other harm to the aggressor, but not death. So, what does the law say? If the offense be not of any of the descriptions specified in section 38, the right of private defense of the body does not extend to the voluntary causing of death to the assailant, but does extend under the restriction specified in section 37 to the voluntary causing to the assailant of any harm other than death. Now, when does the right of private defense begin? At what exact moment does it commence and till when does it continue? Section 40 provides us a clarity regarding this. What section 40 says is, the right of private defense of the body commences as soon as a reasonable apprehension of danger to the body arises from an attempt or threat to commit the offense, though the offense may not have been committed and it continues as long as such apprehension of danger to the body continues. So, what section 40 provides is that you need not wait for the aggressor to actually commit the harm. The moment you have a reasonable apprehension, but then again the term apprehension is qualified by the term reasonable. So, it should not be a mere figment of imagination. You should have reasonable grounds for believing your apprehension should be reasonable, it should be bona fide. So, if you have reasonable grounds for believing that unless and until I act now I could be subjected to harm, it is at that precise moment that your right of private defense comes into existence. And how long will it continue? Till the time the threat does not abate, till the time the offender does not effect, effect his retreat effectively, till that time your right of private defense will continue. Now, Earlier we were talking about right of private defense of body. Section 41 of Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita talks about those circumstances when right of private defense of property also extends to causing death. It says the right of private defense of property extends under the restriction specified in section 37. So, you see section 37 is to be read within all the other provisions relating to right of private defense. So, what 41 says I will repeat the right of private defense of property extends under the restriction specified in section 37 to the voluntary causing of death or of any other harm to the wrongdoer if the offense the committing of which or the attempting to commit which occasions the exercise of the right be an offence of any of the descriptions here and after enumerated. What are those? One, robbery. Second, house breaking after sunset and before sunrise. So, you see it is only house breaking after night that occasions the exercise of right of private defence of property to the extent of even causing the death of the other person. Because if a person breaks into your house at night, so there is a possibility that you might not be aware whether the person is armed, how much harm or damage he can cause to you. So, in such cases the law gives you the benefit that in order to protect your property you have the right to even cause the death of the other person, but this is not available in case the house breaking is done during daytime. It is only available when the house breaking is after sunset and before sunrise. Third, mischief by fire or any explosive substance committed on any building, tent or vessel which building, 
tent or vessel is used as a human dwelling or as a place for custody or property. So, even where such a property is sought to be damaged, you have the right to cause even the death of the aggressor in order to protect any property from mischief by fire or mischief by any explosive substance when it is committed on any building tent or vessel which is used either for human dwelling or which is used to uh, keep your property which is used for the custody of property. Fourth, theft, mischief or house trespass under such circumstances as may reasonably cause apprehension that death or grievous hurt will be the consequence if such right of private defence is not exercised. So, you see in cases of ordinary theft, mischief or trespass right of private defence to the extent of even causing the death of the aggressor is available only when the theft, mischief or house trespass is done under circumstances that leads to a reasonable apprehension that death or grievous hurt might be the result of such theft, mischief or house trespass. Section 42, when such right extends to causing any harm other than death. So, what 42 of the BNS says is, if the offence the committing of which or the attempting to commit which occasions the exercise of right of private defence be theft, mischief or criminal trespass not of any of the descriptions specified in section 41 that right does not extend to voluntary causing of death but does extend subject to the restrictions mentioned in section 37 to the voluntary causing to the wrongdoer of any harm other than death. Now, when does the right of private defence of property come into existence and how long does it continue? Section 43 provides a clarity regarding the commencement and continuance of the right of private defence of property. Section 43 reads, the right of private defence of property commences when a reasonable apprehension of danger to the property commences against theft it continues till the time the offender has effected his retreat with the property or either the assistance of the public authorities is obtained or the property has been recovered. Against robbery it continues as long as the offender causes or attempts to cause to any person death or hurt or wrongful restraint or as long as the fear of instant death or of instant hurt or of instant personal restraint continues. Against criminal trespass or mischief it continues as long as the offender continues in the commission of criminal trespass or mischief. Against house breaking after sunset and before sunrise, it continues as long as the house trespass which has begun by such house breaking continues. Now section 44, it explains a very important rule. See what is a person expected to do when you cannot exercise your right of private defence without involving harm to an innocent person. See you have a right of private defence to a, against an aggressor. But what if there is a circumstance in which if you were to exercise your right of private defence, some innocent person could be harmed? So, in such cases would the right of that innocent person prevail or would your right of private defence prevail? So, how to resolve this? Section 44 says, in the exercise of right of private defence against an assault which reasonably causes the apprehension of death. If the defender be so situated that he cannot effectually exercise that risk without risk of harm to an innocent person, his right of private defence extends to running of that risk. So, you see how much importance the law has given to exercise of right of, pres of self preservation, the right of your private defence that would exist no matter how much harm it may entail to another person, if you have a reasonable apprehension that you might be harmed, you have every right 
to defend yourselves and exercise force in order to protect yourselves. There is an illustration appended to section 44 to further clarify the situation. A is attacked by a mob who attempt to murder him. He cannot effectually exercise his right of private defense without firing on the mob and he cannot fire without risk of harming young children who are mingled with the mob. A commits no offense if by so firing he harms any of the children. There are certain principles and doctrines which every student of criminal law, whoever studies private defense needs to know. The first of those doctrine is doctrine of retreat. This is a common law doctrine of retreat to the wall or retreat to the ditch. Now this is a doctrine which was propounded by Blackstone and this is a principle of criminal law that a victim of murderous assault can choose a safe retreat instead of resorting to deadly force in self-defense. See the basis behind this rule is prevention is better than cure. According to this doctrine, as far as possible, one must avoid a conflict situation. So, if there is any situation involving violence, one must retreat till the proverbial last wall or last ditch beyond which he cannot go. So, what this implies is that there is a proverbial or there is an imaginary wall. I mean, you cannot go beyond that or maybe there is a ditch. If you retreat beyond a certain level, you will yourself fall into that ditch and be harmed. So, as per that English doctrine, a person has to avoid this situation and try to avoid it till the time he cannot avoid it without running any risk of harm to himself. So, it is only when he has no option left that he can justifiably use force in self-defense. Some jurists also cite the significance of human life, even that of an aggressor as one of the reasons to avoid conflict situations. So, this doctrine is applied to cases where a victim being in a place where he has a right to be is in the face of a grave uninvited danger. See, the best defense is often a good defense and the rule of retreat has given way to the doctrine of standing my ground. So, as per this doctrine, the right of a man to stand his ground and defend himself when attacked with a deadly weapon, even to the extent of taking his assailant's life depends upon whether he reasonably believes that he is in immediate danger of death or grievous bodily harm from his assailant and not upon the detached test whether a man of reasonable prudence so situated might not think it possible to fly with safety or to disable his assailant rather than kill him. But fortunately, the rule of retreat as expounded by the Britishers that is not applicable to India. In Indian law, if a man's person or property is in imminent danger of being impaired or attacked, he has the right to resort to such measures as would be reasonably necessary to thwart the attempt to protect himself or his property. The Indian law does not require you to run away in the face of danger. If you are at a place where you have a right to be and if the other person has no business to harm you, then you have every right to protect yourselves against any intended acts of aggression. There is a judgment. In Jaydev versus State of Punjab, the Supreme Court observed that in India, there is no rule which expects a man to run away with confronted with a situation where he can exercise his right of private defense. So, in India, the right of private defense is available the moment you have a reasonable apprehension of threat to your life or property. Unlike in UK, where you have to first try to effect a retreat till the time it is no longer possible for you to retreat and only then you could exercise the right of private defense. Now, after discussing law relating to private defense, students, we move on to the next leg of the session, which is related to abetment.
law relating to abatement. So, let us first of all understand the meaning of the term abatement. The term abatement means giving of some kind of approval, support or encouragement. To abet means to urge, promote or help someone by words or actions in the doing of some act. Abetment by itself is not a crime. It is the unlawful intent behind such abetment which turns it into a crime. In the case of Sri Lal versus state of Madhya Bharat, the court ruled that in order to convict a person of abetting the commission of crime, it is not only necessary to prove that he has taken part in those steps of the transactions which were innocent, but in some way or the other, it is absolutely necessary to connect him with those steps of the transaction which are criminal. Thus, in order to be punishable, there has to be abetment with a guilty mind. So, abetment is illegal only if the acts abetted are punishable as offences under the law. If the act abetted is not an offence punishable under the law, then the abetment of those acts would also not be punishable under the law. A crime may be committed by a single individual or by several persons. When several persons participate in a crime, every person may contribute in a different degree and manner than the others. English law broadly classifies the participants of a crime into principals who are the main offenders and accessories who are the persons who do not commit the crime themselves but who help the principal offenders. So, principal offenders are further classified as principals in the first degree. Who are these people? They are those who are directly involved in the execution of the crime and who participate in the commission of the crime. Then there is principles in the second degree that is those who do not commit the crime with their own hands but are physically present at the scene of crime to assist in the commission of the crime. For example, those who stand guard at the scene or act as a getaway driver. After principles, we come to accessories and accessories are of three types depending upon the stage of their involvement in the crime. These are first accessories before the fact. So, who are accessories before the fact? Persons who are not physically present at the scene of the crime but who directly or indirectly incite, counsel, encourage procure or command another to commit the crime. Next is accessories at the fact. These are principles of the second degree who are present at the scene of crime to aid or assist in the actual commission of the crime. Accessories after the fact are those who after the commission of a crime comfort, assist or help the criminal to make good his escape or who help the criminal to evade punishment. Indian laws do not recognize any such distinct categories of principles and all the persons present at the scene of crime with the common intent or object of the commission of the crime are held jointly responsible. Accessories before the fact are recognized as abettors and law relating to abetment has been laid down under sections 45 to section 60 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita. Accessories after fact can be punished for harboring the offender or giving false information to screen the offender, intentional omission to, op to apprehend on part of public servant or dishonestly receiving stolen property, etc. Section 45 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita defines abetment of a thing. It says, a person abets the doing of a thing who firstly instigates any person to do that thing, secondly 
engages with one or more other person or persons in any conspiracy for the doing of that thing if an act or illegal omission takes place in pursuance of that conspiracy and in order to the doing of that thing or thirdly who intentionally aids by any act or illegal omission the doing of that thing. <clears throat> there are explanations. Explanation 1. A person who by willful misrepresentation or by willful concealment of a material fact which he is bound to disclose. See, when a person has a duty to speak, so if a person refuses to tell the truth, if he refuses to disclose that, that he was required by law to do, that is also an unlawful omission. So, as per the explanation, a person who by willful misrepresentation or by willful concealment of a material fact, which he is bound to disclose, voluntarily causes or procures or attempts to cause or procure a thing to be done is said to instigate the doing of that thing. Let us see the illustration. A. A public officer is authorized by a warrant from a court of justice to apprehend Z. B. Knowing that fact and also that C is not Z willfully represents to A that C is Z and thereby he intentionally causes A to apprehend C. Here B abets by instigation the apprehension of C. Explanation 2. Whoever either prior to or at the time of commission of an act does anything in order to facilitate the commission of that act and thereby facilitates the commission thereof is said to aid the doing of that act. Now what amounts to abetment by instigation? Instigation means to incite, to provoke, to persuade or to urge someone to do a wrongful act. To instigate means to actively suggest or stimulate another by any means, by language, direct or indirect, whether it takes the form of express solicitations or of hints, insinuations or encouragement. See, it is not necessary that the accused should instigate the offender face to face. Instigation may be through letters, through emails, messages or through telephonic conversations too. Even indirect suggestions may amount to instigation provided such indirect suggestions are affirmative and likely to produce the desired result. A willful misrepresentation or willful concealment of a material fact which one is legally duty bound to disclose also amounts to abetment by instigation. Advice per se would not amount to instigation unless it was meant to actively suggest or stimulate the commission of an offence. To constitute instigation, it is not necessary that actual words must be used to that effect. It is also not necessary that the words or expressions used to instigate be specifically suggestive of the consequence. Yet, a reasonable certainty to incite the consequence must be capable of being spelt out. So, a word uttered in fit of anger or emotion without intending the consequences to actually flow cannot be said to be instigation. There is a judgment in this regard. In the case of Ram Singh versus State of Punjab and others, while rejecting the wife's contention that her in-laws incited her husband to marry again, the court observed that a mere acquiescence or permission does not amount to instigation. In this case, there was no material whatsoever to show any knowledge or design on the part of petitioners either to arrange the alleged second marriage or to negotiate the same or to participate therein. Even their presence at the marriage ceremony could not be ascertained. 
the court held that the petitioners had no role to play in the so called second marriage of the complainant's husband Dr. Satinder Singh. Thus, abetment by instigation was not proved. Now, moving on to the next kind of abetment which is abetment by conspiracy. A person is guilty of abetment by conspiracy if he engages with one or more persons in any conspiracy for the doing of an illegal act or a legal act by illegal means and when some act is done in pursuance thereof. One is said to engage with other persons in conspiracy when he enters into an agreement with them to do an illegal act or do an act that is not illegal by illegal means. To constitute abetment by conspiracy, mere agreement is not sufficient. Some act or omission in furtherance of the offence abetted must take place. It is not necessary to the commission of the offence of abetment by conspiracy that the abetter should concert the offence with the person who commits it. It is sufficient if he engages in the conspiracy in pursuance of which the offence is committed. Next we move on to abetment by aid. Aid may be rendered by an act of commission as well as by way of illegal omission when one is legally duty bound to act. So, when you are under a legal obligation to act, so either when there is an illegal omission that would also amount to an illegal act because the way BNS defines act, act includes illegal omission. So, a person abets by aiding when by the commission of an act, he intends to facilitate and does facilitate the commission thereof. Mere intention to facilitate even coupled with an act calculated to facilitate is not sufficient to constitute abetment unless the act which is intended to be facilitated actually takes place and is facilitated thereby. Mere presence at scene of crime or non-interference would not amount to abetment by aid unless the presence or non-interference was deliberate and intentional. Mere giving of aid by act or omission would not constitute abetment by aid unless the person who so acts or omits knows that some offence was planned or contemplated. A person cannot be held guilty of aiding the doing of an act when the act has not been done at all. For example, Z strikes B. B is by this provocation excited to violent rage. A. A bystander intending to take advantage of B's rage and to cause him to kill Z puts a knife into B's hand for that purpose. Now B kills Z with the knife. Here B would be guilty only of culpable homicide because he was acting in a fit of rage and in a fit of rage he did that act whereas A would be guilty of murder. Now let us understand who is an abettor. Section 46 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita deals with abettor. It says a person abets an offence who abets either the commission of an offence or the commission of an act which would be an offence if committed by a person capable by law of committing an offence with the same intention or knowledge as that of the abettor. Explanation 1. The abetment of illegal omission of an act may amount to an offence although the abettor may not himself be bound to do that act. Explanation 2. To constitute the offence of abetment, it is not necessary that the act abetted should be committed or that the effect requisite to constitute the offence could be caused. Illustrations A. A instigates B to murder C. B refuses to do so. A is guilty of abetting B to commit murder. So, you see the one who instigates is the abetter. Similarly, there is illustration B. A instigates B to murder D. 
B in pursuance of the instigation stabs D. D recovers from the wound. A is guilty of instigating B to commit murder. Explanation 3. It is not necessary that the person abetted should be capable by law of committing an offence or that he should have the same guilty intention or knowledge as that of the abettor or any guilty intention or knowledge. There are further illustrations to make us understand explanation 3. See A. With a guilty intention, abets a child or a person of unsound mind to commit an act which would be an offence if committed by a person capable by law of committing an offence and having the same intention as A. Here A, whether the act be committed or not, is guilty of abetting an offence. Illustration B. A. With the intention of murdering Z, instigates B, a child under 7 years of age, to do an act which causes Z's death. B, in consequence of the abetment, does the act in the absence of A and thereby causes Z's death. Here, though B was not capable by law of committing an offence, A is liable to be punished in the same manner as if B had been capable by law of committing an offence and had committed murder and he is therefore subject to the punishment of death. Illustration C. A instigates B to set fire to a dwelling house. B, in consequence of his unsoundness of mind, being incapable of knowing the nature of the act or that he is doing what is wrong or contrary to law, sets fire to the house in consequence of A's instigation. B has committed no offence, but A is guilty of abetting the offence of setting fire to a dwelling house and is liable to the punishment provided for that offence. Illustration D. A intending to cause a theft to be committed, instigates B to take property belonging to Z out of Z's possession. A induces B to believe that the property belongs to A. B takes the property out of Z's possession in good faith, believing it to be A's own property. B acting under this misconception does not take dishonestly and therefore does not commit theft. But A is guilty of abetting theft and is liable to the same punishment as if B had committed theft. Explanation 4. The abetment of an offence being an offence, the abetment of such an abetment is also an offence. So, you see abetment of an abetment is also an offence. There are illustrations to further clarify explanation 4. A instigates B to instigate C to murder Z. B accordingly instigates C to murder Z and C commits that offence in consequence of B's instigation. B is liable to be punished for his offence with the punishment for murder and as A instigated B to commit the offence, A is also liable to the same punishment. Explanation 5. It is not necessary to the commission of the offence of abetment by conspiracy that the abettor should concert the offence with the person who commits it. It is sufficient if he engages in the conspiracy in pursuance of which the offence is committed. Illustration A concerts with B a plan for poisoning Z. It is agreed that A shall administer the poison. B then explains the plan to C mentioning that a third person is to administer the poison but without mentioning A's name. C agrees to procure the poison and procures and delivers it to B for the purpose of its being used in the manner explained. A administers the poison, Z dies in consequence. Here though A and C have not conspired together, yet C has been engaged in the conspiracy in pursuance of which Z has been murdered. C has therefore committed the offence defined in this section and is liable for the punishment for murder. Section 47 talks about abetment in India of offences that are committed outside India. 
a person abets an offence within the meaning of this Sanhita who in India abets the commission of any act without and beyond India which would constitute an offence if committed in India. Illustration A in India instigates B, a foreigner in country X to commit a murder in that country. A is guilty of abetting murder. Section 48. Abetment outside India for offence in India. A person abets an offence within the meaning of the Sanhita who without and beyond India abets the commission of any act in India which would constitute an offence if committed in India. Illustration A in country X instigates B to commit a murder in India. So, A is guilty of abetting murder irrespective of the fact that that person was not in India at the time when he gave the abetment but still he would be guilty of abetting murder which is punishable under the BNS. Section 49 talks about punishment of abetment if act abetted is committed in consequence and where no express provision is made for its punishment. It reads whoever abets any offence shall if the act abetted is committed in consequence of the abetment and no express provision is made by the Sahita for the punishment of such abetment be punished with the punishment provided for the offence. As per the explanation an act or offence is said to be committed in consequence of abetment when it is committed in consequence of the instigation or in pursuance of the conspiracy or with the aid which constitutes the abetment. Illustrations A instigates B to give false evidence. B in consequence of the instigation commits that offence. A is guilty of abetting that offence and is liable to the same punishment as B. Illustration B A and B conspire to poison Z. A in pursuance of the conspiracy procures the poison and delivers it to B in order that he may administer it to Z. B in pursuance of the conspiracy administers the poison to Z in A's absence and thereby causes Z's death. Here B is guilty of murder and A, A is guilty of abetting that offence by conspiracy and is also liable to the punishment for murder. Moving on to section 50 which deals with punishment of abetment if person abetted does act with different intention from that of abetter. Whoever abets the commission of an offence shall if the person abetted does the act with a different intention or knowledge from that of the abetter be punished with the punishment provided for the offence which would have been committed if the act had been done with the intention or knowledge of the abetter and with no other. Section 51 talks about liability of abetter when one act is abetted and different act is done. So, when an act is abetted and the act that is done is different from the act that was abetted, then the abetter is liable for the act done in the same manner and to the same extent as if he had directly abetted it provided that the act done was a probable consequence of the abetment and was committed under the influence of the investigation of the instigation or with the aid or in pursuance of the conspiracy which constituted the abetment. So, if the abetter uh, abets some other act and the accused does some different act then the liability of abetter would not be for that act unless and until it was a reasonable and probable consequence of the act that was abetted. Illustrations A instigates a child to put poison into the food of Z and gives him poison for that purpose. The child in consequence of the instigation by mistake puts the poison into the food of Y which is by the side of that of Z. Here if the child was acting under the influence of A's instigation and the act done was under the circumstances a probable consequence of abetment, A is liable in the same manner and to the same extent as if he had instigated the child to put poison into the food of Y. Illustration B A instigates B to burn Z's house. 
B sets fire to the house and at the same time commits theft of property there. A. Though guilty of abetting the burning of the house, is not guilty of abetting the theft for the theft was a distinct act and that was not a probable consequence of burning. See burning and theft these are distinct acts. They are not closely related and burning is not a natural consequence of theft and neither is does it work the other way around that is theft is not a natural consequence of burning. Illustration C. A instigates B and C to break into an inhabited house at midnight for the purpose of robbery and provides them with arms for that purpose. B and C break into the house and being resisted by Z, who is one of the inmates, murder Z. Here, if that murder was the probable consequence of the abetment, A is liable to the punishment provided for murder. Section 52 talks about liability of abetter to, cumulati to cumulative punishment for the act which is abetted and also for the act which is done. So, as per section 52, if the act for which the abetter is liable under section 51 is committed in addition to the act abetted and it constitutes a distinct offence, the abetter is liable for punishment for each of the offences. See, if A instigates B to resist by force a distress made by a public servant, B in consequence resists that distress. In offering the resistance, B voluntarily causes grievous hurt to the officer executing the distress. As B has committed both the offence of resisting the distress and also the offence of voluntarily causing grievous hurt, B is liable to punishment for both these offences. And if A knew that B was likely to voluntarily cause grievous hurt in resisting the distress, then A will also be liable to punishment for each of these offences irrespective of the fact that he did not abet the causing of grievous hurt. Then section 53 talks about liability of abetter for an effect caused by act abetted different from that intended by abetter. When an act is abetted with the intention on part of abetter of causing a particular effect and an act for which the abetter is liable in consequence of the abetment causes a different effect from that intended by the abetter, the abetter is liable for the effect caused in the same manner and to the same extent as if he had abetted the act with the intention of causing that effect provided he knew that the act abetted was likely to cause that effect. Illustration. A instigates B to cause grievous hurt to Z. B in consequence of the instigation causes grievous hurt to Z. Z dies in consequence. Here if A knew that grievous hurt abetted was likely to cause death, A is liable to be punished with the punishment provided for murder. See what would be the liability when abetter is present when offence is committed? Section 54 provides that whenever any person who is absent would be liable to be punished as an abettor is present when the act or offence for which he would be punishable in consequence of the abetment is committed, then he shall be deemed to have committed such act or offence. Section 55 deals with abetment of an offence which is punishable with the death or imprisonment for life. It says, Whoever abets the commission of an offence punishable with death or imprisonment for life shall, if that offence be not committed in consequence of the abetment and no express provision is made either under the Sahita for the punishment of such abetment, be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 7 years and shall also be liable for to fine and if any act for which the abettor is liable in consequence of the abetment and which causes hurt to any person is done, then the abettor shall be liable to imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 14 years and shall also be liable to fine. Illustration A instigates B to murder Z. The offence is not committed. 
if B had murdered Z, he would have been subject to punishment of death or imprisonment for life. Therefore, A is liable to imprisonment for a term which may extend to 7 years and also to a fine and if any hurt be done to Z in consequence of the abetment, he will be liable to imprisonment for a term which may extend to 14 years and to fine. Section 56 talks about abetment of offence which is punishable with imprisonment. So, whoever abets an offence punishable with imprisonment shall, if that offence be not committed in consequence of the abetment and no express provision is made under the Sahita for the punishment of such abetment, be punished with imprisonment of any description provided for that offence for a term which may extend to one fourth part of the longest term provided for that offence or with such fine as is provided for that offence or with both. And if the abettor or the person abetted is a public servant whose duty it is to prevent the commission of such offence, the abettor shall be punished with imprisonment of any description provided for that offence for a term which may extend to one half of the longest term provided for that offence or with such fine as is provided for the offence or with both. Now let us look at the illustrations. A instigates B to give false evidence. Here, if B does not give false evidence, A has nevertheless committed the offence defined in this section and is punishable accordingly. Illustration B. A. A police officer whose duty it is to prevent robbery abets the commission of robbery. Here, though the robbery be not committed, A is liable to one half of the longest term of imprisonment provided for that offence and also to fine. Illustration C. B abets the commission of a robbery by A, a police officer whose duty it is to prevent that offence. Here, though the robbery be not committed, B is liable to one half of the longest term of imprisonment provided for the offence of robbery and also to fine. Section 57 deals with abetting commission of offence by public or by more than 10 persons. So, what does it say? Whoever abets the commission of an offence by the public generally or by any number or class of persons exceeding 10 shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 7 years and also with fine. There is an illustration which further explains the provisions of section 57. It says, A affixes in a public place a placard instigating a sect consisting of more than 10 members to meet at a certain time and place for the purpose of attacking the members of an adverse sect while engaged in a procession. Now here, what has A committed? A has committed the offence which has been defined in section 57 which is abetting commission of offence by public or by more than 10 persons. Coming to section 58, which deals with concealing design to commit offence punishable with death or punishable with imprisonment for life. So, whoever intending to facilitate or knowing it to be likely that he will thereby facilitate the commission of an offence punishable with death or imprisonment for life voluntarily conceals by any act or omission or by the use of encryption or any other information hiding tool the existence of a design to commit such offence or makes any representation which he knows to be false respecting such design shall. If that offence be committed, be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to seven years. And in cases where the offence is not committed, 
then shall be punishable with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 3 years and in such cases shall also be liable to fine. Illustration to section 58 to further clarify this. A knowing that dacoity is about to be committed at B falsely informs the magistrate that a dacoity is about to be committed at C a place in an opposite direction and thereby misleads the magistrate with intent to facilitate the commission of the offence. The dacoity is committed at B in pursuance of the design. So, A would be punishable under this section. So, you see under section 58 it is not only the direct act of abetment but the act of concealing a design of commission of an offence which is also punishable under the law. Coming to section 59, when a public servant conceals a design to commit an offence which it is his duty to prevent. So, whoever being a public servant intending to facilitate or knowing it to be likely that he will thereby facilitate the commission of an offence which it is his duty as such public servant to prevent voluntarily conceals by any act or omission or by use of encryption or any other information hiding tool the existence of a design to commit such offence or makes any representation which he knows to be false respecting such design shall if the offence be committed be punished with imprisonment of any description provided for the offence for a term which may extend to one half of the longest term of such imprisonment or with such fine as is provided for that offence or with both. In cases where the offence is punishable with death or imprisonment for life with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and if the offence be not committed then shall be punished with imprisonment of either description provided for the offence for a term which may extend to one fourth part of the longest term of such imprisonment or with such fine as is provided for the offence or with both. What does the illustration say? A. An officer of police being legally bound to give information of all designs to commit robbery which may come to his knowledge and knowing that B designs to commit robbery omits to give such information with intent so to facilitate the commission of that robbery. Here A has by an illegal omission concealed the existence of B's design and is liable to punishment according to provisions of this section. Section 60 deals with concealing of design to commit an offence which is punishable with imprisonment and it says that whoever intending to facilitate or knowing it to be likely that he will thereby facilitate the commission of an offence punishable with imprisonment voluntarily conceals by any act or illegal omission the existence of a design to commit such offence or makes any representation which he knows to be false respecting such design shall if the offence be committed be punished with imprisonment of the description provided for the offence which for a term which may extend to one fourth and if the offence be not committed to one eighth of the longest term of such imprisonment or with such fine as is provided for the offence or with both. So students that brings us to the end of this lesson in which we discussed the incidences when right of private defence extends to the voluntary causing of the death of the aggressor in order to protect one's person or property and we also dealt with law relating to abetment. So, that will be all for this lesson. We will meet you again very soon along with another session on criminal conspiracy and attempts. Thank you. <laughs>